Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for standing by. All participants are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's webinar. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. I am Nikki Grimsley with the Clinician Outreach and Communication Activity, or COCA, with the Division of Emergency Operations at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We are delighted to welcome you to today's webinar, Honeybees, a new species for veterinarians. COCA is excited to offer this call in partnership with the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine. We are pleased to have with us today Dr. Christopher Free continuing education is offered for this call. Instructions on how to earn continuing education will be provided at the end. At the conclusion of today's session, you will be able to describe why honeybees are now calling, why beekeepers are now calling veterinarians, explain the veterinary client-patient relationship as it applies to veterinarians, beekeepers, and honeybees, Describe common bacterial infections of honeybees and use of antibiotics in honeybees, and list some of the opportunities for veterinarians and honeybee veterinary medicine. CDC are planners, presenter, and their spouses and partners wish to disclose they have no financial interest or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters with the exception of Dr. Chris. He would like to disclose that he will mention the availability, use, and status of Fumagellin, which is an antibiotic used to control Nosema. Fumagellin is allowed into the U.S. from Canada under FDA enforcement discretion. Planners have reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. At the end of the presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask the presenter questions. You may submit questions through the webinar system at any time during the presentation by selecting the Questions tab on the webinar screen and typing in your question. Or you may click on the Raise Your Hand icon on the webinar screen and your line will be unmuted so that you may ask a question. Our presenter today is Dr. Christopher Cripps. Dr. Cripps started keeping bees when he earned the Boy Scout Merit Badge in beekeeping. He took beekeeping classes with labs at Cornell and worked as a bee, keep, a bee inspector for Franklin and Delaware counties in Ohio during veterinary school. He then worked as a dairy practitioner for 17 years before buying Better Bee. As one of three veterinary owners of Better Bee, he is involved in day-to-day -day activities of an internet and bricks and mortar honey bee supply business. He also teaches a number of classes and works with customers to help diagnose and correct problems that come up with their bees. He is also the president of the Southern Adirondack Beekeepers Association, a 300-member local beekeeper group. He is also the webmaster of Honey Bee Veterinary Consortium. At this time, we welcome Dr. Cripps. Dr. Cripps, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Nikki, and thank you, everybody, for coming by and uh, listening to this. Um, so I, I gave a talk similar to this at the AVMA, um, and figured we could repeat that here and uh, try to fill out some more things that have changed since last August. Um, so like Nikki said, I started bees as a Boy Scout Merit Badge project. You know, people say, how'd you get into bees? You were a veterinarian for so long, but it actually was quite a bit before I got into veterinary school that I was getting into bees. Um, and back then, it wasn't really cool to be a beekeeper. You know, you kind of did your thing, and you were the, you know, the weird kid that liked the stinging insects. Um, you know, now it's really cool, and everybody and their brother's sister seems to be becoming a beekeeper. Um, you know, but it wasn't always that way. So we had some bee biology classes at Cornell. It was nice to have some uh, AP biology credits to get me into electives early on. So I got to work for Roger Morris, who's a professor at Cornell, um, writes quite a few wrote quite a few books, um, had a lot of fun with him. Went on to The Ohio State University for Veterinary Medicine and saw an ad for one of the local beekeeping clubs and uh, went, went to one of their meetings. And it was kind of interesting to see that there were other beekeepers because, you know, I, I'd only really known one other beekeeper when I was up in New Hampshire. 
So at that club, they uh, mentioned that they needed some bee inspectors for the area. Um, picked that up as a summer job. Did that for a couple of years while I was while I was in veterinary school. Um, oops, I went too far. Um, so 1995, I graduated, uh, moved up to Greenwich, New York, which is where Better Bee was located. Um, so it was nice having a bee supply store right in the neighborhood. Uh, worked as a dairy veterinarian, so on the road all the time. And um, you know, the guy in the picture to the right, on the far right, was my partner Joe Callie, and Jack Rath, the guy in the middle, was our um, was at the practice to the north of us at Granville Veterinary. So three veterinarians, we got together in 2012 when Better Bee was coming up for sale, uh, went together and bought that business, and the three of us are working full time at that and um, you know, really enjoying it. We thought, thought this would be a, a nice transition out of practice. One of our first things we did was we lined up some, some bees that we were buying out of Georgia. So we would bring package bees up to the northeast um, we would go down to Georgia, pick up a trailer load of bees, and bring them back. While we were there, we are telling Reg Wilbanks, who's the owner of that business, uh, how we were probably the largest veterinary clinic for bees in the country. And you know, nobody was really had bees on their mind for veterinarians at the time. And he told us that he actually had seven veterinarians working for him at one point. So they were all trained in Argentina and had worked um, you know, raising queens and producing bees and, you know, keeping his hives uh, working well. So, you know, you kind of think, do you, did you miss this in vet school? And, you know, at the AVMA convention 2015, uh, I saw Kent Hoblet and he said, you know, what are we going to do about bees? I noticed that in the uh, Mexico City Veterinary School that they had bees in their curriculum, and I've never heard of that in the U.S. And I think he was kind of, you know, in jest a little bit. But then, you know, my next stop was at the USDA table or the FDA table, learning about the VFD and the new new rules that were coming out. So those rules kind of put the beekeepers and the veterinarians together. And I'm not sure that either group has uh, fully embraced this idea yet. But um, you know, they're going to need to because the veterinarians are kind of gatekeepers here and the beekeepers are coming to understand that and um, you know looking to see what the veterinarians can do for them. So honeybees are food producing animals. They have been. The, they're antibiotics for bees and they've been on the label. So this is not something new coming to the label. This is something that's been on the label but they were all over the counter uses. So with the FDA, the Food Safety Modernization Act, you know, we need to start working proactively to eliminate problems. The National Action Plan for combat, combating uh, antibiotic-resistant bacteria, you know, laid out a few different things that need to be done. And you know, people talk about the human side, and I, there's things that are happening over there. But on our side, in the food-producing animals, they look to eliminate the use of medically important antibiotics for growth promotion. So that's all happened now. Um, everything's moved so that antibiotics are listed for treatment, control, or prevention of a disease, and they require veterinary oversight. Either a VFD or a prescription needs to be issued depending on um, which antibiotics are going to be used. And we're going to talk about that quite a bit because there's, there's major differences for honeybees in VFDs and prescriptions and a lot of people are assuming that they need a VFD when I think most of the time a prescription is really what they're looking for. So honeybees and antibiotics, what, what's been going on? So the three antibiotics that are labeled for honeybees are oxytetracycline, tylosin, and lincomycin. And all three of these antibiotics have been fed like the picture on the right, where you mix the antibiotic with sugar, you sprinkle the sugar and antibiotic mixture in a beehive around the edges. So we're looking not to put it in the middle because a lot of these antibiotics are actually toxic to the brood, the baby bees. Um, so, the, so this is one of the methods that's used. All three of these antibiotics are labeled for giving 
to honeybees this way. Um, Oxytetracycline has a label for the control of American and European fowl brood, and tylosin and lincomycin are labeled for the control of American fowl brood. So, you know, we know that antibiotics have been around for a while. Beekeepers have used them. This is in a lot of the books, you know, saying that it's okay to use them and actually recommended. Um, but in the Bee Informed Partnership, which is an extension effort out of the University of Maryland that's got quite a bit of cooperation amongst many universities, um, they did a study in 2015 where they surveyed 5,000 beekeepers and about 1 in 14 reported using antibiotics. And when they look at the number of hives that these folks reported, they averaged about 900 hives. So most of the antibiotic use seems to be in larger beekeepers. You know, and if you're thinking, oh boy, you know, 900 hives, um, this is where I think my background as a dairy veterinarian is coming in because, you know, we can work on this as a production medicine idea rather than just an individual dog and cat or an individual pet idea, um, you know, that's going to affect us as well, but I think it's going to be less called for by the beekeepers. So commercial beekeepers, you know, they've been feeding this mixture. Um, typically oxytetracycline is what they've used. This has been around for a long time. Previous to this, sulfos were used. Um, so this is a, you know, this, this disease, American fowl brood, is something that beekeepers have been using antibiotics for a number of years to try to, try to combat. They have very little idea of what they're doing when they do that, though. It is over the counter, so they can actually, you know, could, could get this product and use it safely. Um, but basically, they thought, we'll use Oxytep to start. And then if that doesn't work, we'll switch to Thailand or Tylosin now that that was available. Uh, there's very few beekeepers that actually use lincomycin. That's the most recently approved drug um, of those three. You're looking at the picture on the upper right. This is a tractor trailer full of honeybees, honeybee hives. And these are moved into you know, the almonds in California and probably a third to two-thirds of the bees in the country end up in a few counties in California for the month of February. Um, so this is, this is a huge deal where bees need to be early, ready very early in the season in order to do pollination. And when they're in the almonds, they're conglomerated from all over the place. So a lot of bees come from the north where they might be overwintered. Some of them come from the south. Um, a lot of people in the north will move bees to the south and then be able to move, you know, have them strong enough to move into almonds um, when, they're, when they're there. Each one of these hives in the last year was, was gathering probably $150 to $200 for the beekeeper, um, you know, providing much more value to the almond growers, you know, in the crop of almonds that they were helping to set, but, um, you know, quite a bit of money for the, for the beekeeper as well that's providing the pollination services. One of the guys that does this was talking to me and he says, you know, everybody comes from everywhere. So it's a cesspool of disease that we have to that we have to jump into in order to provide this service. And you know, from biosecurity end of things, it really probably is. You know, if you're gathering up all the animals from the country in one in a few counties, um, you know, that probably not the best practices for biosecurity. So prior to transportation, though, anybody that was going there would need to have a certificate of inspection from their state apiaries. Um, so this is somebody who works usually in plant industry rather than animal industry. They're going to go out and examine a set of bees. Um, they're going to determine how many bees they think they need to um, how many they need to examine and how much of each hive they need to examine. Um, you know, different states may have different rules, um, you know, but if you have 50 bees in a, in a yard, 50 hives of bees in a yard, you know, is it okay to pull two frames of brood out of the fourth and 18th hive, or do we need to inspect more in order to find American fowl brood? American fowl brood, we're thinking, is about a 1 to 2% prevalence across the country. 
So it's not as common as it used to be. So part of the reason it's not as common is we have the state inspectors. So the state apiary departments have gone around, they've looked for this for a number of years, and they've made people burn hives that have been affected. And because this bacteria makes a spore that's very difficult to kill, um, you know, burning is one of the major things that affects that, um, or that can actually destroy the spores. Radiation is the other thing that would do it, and you know, I know in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, and I'm sure other places through the country, um, there are people who have set up with uh, some of the large gamma radiators to be able to run honeybee hives through the irradiation chambers. You know, there's no bees in there when they do that, but they're, um, you know, running run those through in these in these big um, chambers. So beekeepers, you know, they start thinking about needing a veterinarian, and the first question I get is, well, how much is that going to cost? You know, so they they tend to be a fairly frugal bunch that doesn't really want to spend money. Um, on anything they don't need to. And a lot of beekeepers right now are saying, you know, why should I hire a veterinarian? Because I know more than the veterinarian. And, um, you know, I think that's one of the things that we as veterinarians need to work on and try to educate beekeepers, educate ourselves, you know, that we can actually bring quite a bit to the table with what we know about disease control. Um, you know, and if we add in some of the bee knowledge here, you know, we can, we can make some pretty big strides, I think, fairly quickly. So in order to help you get educated, I figured we'd cover a little bit on bee biology. And um, you know, we have a picture here of some brood. So that's what we call the baby bees. And they start as an egg. They, the egg hatches. We have a larva. The larva um, goes through to the pupa stage. And then after the pupa, we have the adult emerge. So it's a complete metamorphosis. Um, and we have one queen that's going to be in the hive laying the eggs that are going to go through these metamorphoses. And you know she can lay one to 2,000 eggs per day. So basically, this queen is going to be an egg-laying machine. The bees bring her food. They take away her waste. And she just keeps laying eggs all day long. The worker egg to adult time, you know, from when the egg is laid until we have an adult Worker bee coming out is about 21 days, so these are important numbers to know as you're looking at, at bees and, and what signs they might have. The queen is only going to take about 16 and a half days. She's fed a lot better than the workers, so she develops a lot faster. Um, the drone takes 24 days. So for, for veterinarians and beekeepers that are looking at diseases, this is very important because the varroa mite which is the major problem that the bees are facing now, uh, can produce about two more offspring for every time it goes into the brood. Um, so it's, it's going to go in with a larva right before it gets um, turning into a pupa. It's going to eat the, on the pupa, reproduce, and we'll get two more offspring if they do that inside with a drone rather than inside with a worker. So important biology difference to know about. So the queen is a um, is a female, and so are the workers. And I put in there that they're diploid because the honeybee has a haploid diploid sex determination. So if you're if you have two sets of chromosomes, then you're going to be either a worker or a queen. And the difference there is going to be the housing that the bees provide for you while you're developing and the food that they give you while you're developing. The drone is the male. It's actually haploid. So the drone doesn't have a father. He comes from an unfertilized egg. And um, you know the drone is going to mate with the queen. But we're going to talk a little bit about sex here with the bees. They don't do this inside the hive. They go out, and they fly away, and they do this outside in the air. So you know many many feet up in the air. This picture that we have here is the guy with a big fishing pole, and at the other end of the fishing pole, he's got some helium balloons and a queen, a virgin queen, tied onto a string that hangs down from the balloons. 
And we have a bunch of drones that are flying up trying to mate this queen as she's flying through the air. So this is something that's going to happen. The queens might fly one distance from the hive, the drones another distance, so we get some um, you know, crossbreeding. We don't have the queen breeding with her sons um, you know, or her, her brothers. Um, when that queen is hatched or emerges, you know, she'll go through that 16 and a half days from being an egg, a larva, a pupa, then she comes out as an adult. It'll take her about a week to get ready to fly. So she'll, you know, mature her muscles, her skeleton, her wings, and then in her second week of life, she's going to go out on these mating flights. She's going to mate with about 8 to 20 different drones over the course of a week. And she's never going to mate again after that. So after that second week of her life, she's pretty well done. She's been mated, and she has to now store that sperm inside her spermatheca for the rest of her life. And a queen could live five to six years. Um, one of the problems that we're having now with queens is that they seem to peter out fairly quickly. And the question is, you know, what's happening there? One of the thoughts is that maybe we're having some sublethal insults um, to the sperm so that the queen runs out of sperm. So now she's not able to lay a fertilized egg. She can't make any more workers. The bees will recognize that and actually try to replace her with one of her daughters. So we look at bees and we start to think about the housing of the bees. And up here in the top right, I've got a picture of some bees that you know built their own housing on the edge of a on the edge of a roof line, and um, you know, they made some combs there just hanging off the roof. And there's a guy back in 1852 named Lorenzo Langstroth that kind of observed when bees made combs like that, they kept them a certain distance apart, which was about three-eighths of an inch, and he called that the bee space. And bees that find a space less than that will tend to fill it in with propolis, which is, you know, things like pine pitch that they've gathered from uh, plants and trees and you know, try to fill in that hole to kind of waterproof it and keep anything else from being able to be in there. If it's a, a space over that amount, they'll fill it with some comb. And so by knowing these things and observing these things, he came up with the idea that we could have movable frames. So in the beehive picture on the right, this is basically what we use today for a beehive, and it's um, you know, a design that came you know, from this mid to late 1800s. Um, where he would make a frame of wood that the comb would sit in, and we would, he would be able to remove that comb from the hive so that he could look and see what the bees were doing and look and see uh, what, what was happening on the comb. It's now a legal requirement in every state in the country to, that if you keep bees, you have to keep them in, comb, in movable frame hives so that they can be inspected for disease. And this has been one of the major improvements and why we have 1 to 2% um, American fowl brood, whereas before, you know, people talk about having 40 or 50% prevalence of American fowl brood. So as the bees are building, we look here in this top picture on the right, we're seeing the bottom of a bee. So we've got the, you know, we're, it's a picture taken through glass of the ventrum of a bee. And you can see their abdomen is in the upper right-hand corner, and there's wax scales that are there. So the bees produce wax in glands on their stomach, on their abdomen, and they're, um, they'll take those little pieces of wax off, chew them up, and they'll put them in to build the comb. So if you've ever seen the pictures of the paper nest, you know, and see honey dripping out of that, that's really, those are paper hornets. That's Polistes and Vespa, Vespula. That's not honeybees. So honeybees are going to have all wax in their nest. And they're going to look for something like a, a hollow tree or a box to go into rather than building a nest out in the open air out of paper like the hornets and wasps would do. This is wax. So, you know, any lipophilic chemical could be attracted into the wax. We could have it sitting there for a long time. So one of the things that we're finding now is quite a bit of pesticides that have built up in the wax. Some of those are coming, ones that the beekeepers have applied, trying to 
control varroa mites, and some of those are agricultural chemicals that they're picking up from outside the hive. Um, you know, but we've got a place to look for lipophilic chemicals here. The population of the hive is going to vary quite a bit through the course of the year. So they're going to have a small number that they're going to take through the winter, um, build up to quite a few in the middle of the summer when they've got a good honey flow going on, um, you know, and then come back to a small number to go through the rest of the year as well. Um, basically, in the small part of the year, they're going to have about 10,000 bees, and that's going to be a typical starting size for, for how we want to start bees. So if, as a beekeeper, I'm looking to start with bees, I might get a, a package of bees, which is the picture in the middle of the screen. Um, you know, this is a can of sugar syrup to feed the bees, a queen that's in a wooden cage, and then about three pounds of bees um, put around there. So it's kind of like making a swarm, which is the bottom picture. So the bees in a hive somewhere said, you know, things are going well enough here that we should reproduce. And being a superorganism, they don't reproduce one at a time. That's not the important thing. The important thing is to reproduce the colony. So there's the queen left with a group of bees, and they're looking, right now they're sitting on that um, pear tree looking for somewhere to go to be able to start their next hive. So there's a queen and a bunch of bees there, very similar to what's in the package. The box at the top is a nucleus colony. So we'll um, actually be able to buy five frames of, of bees, you know, so kind of like a miniature hive ready to go. And what we would do then is just move those frames into that beehive, and then as the bees, you know, have more babies and grow, they would expand to fill those boxes, and we would pile more boxes up on top in order to, to fill more of those. Um, if in the course of the year we have extra honey beyond what we think the bees are going to need for the winter time when they don't have any nectar coming in, um, then we can take that off as extra honey that we would use for, for humans. There's you know some active bee colonies here. You can see you know three three boxes on most of these. The guy in the bottom right, you know, this is um, some hives in Ohio during the during the honey flow, so he's got some more hives with some extra honey on there ready to come off. So the food storage that they're doing, they're basically looking for protein, carbohydrates, you know, are going to be our major food items, just like it would be with any other animal. So the protein is going to come from the pollen. So they're going to go out looking to, you know, get into the nectaries of the flower and be able to collect nectar, but at the same time, they're, they're electrostatically charged, and they have a lot of short little hairs on their body that are going to pick up other little um, grains, such as the pollen, that they're then going to comb back off their body, and they're going to store in these, what we call a pollen basket on their back leg. Um, and that's what they're going to use for their proteins, you know, various amino acids. And different plants have different amino acid profiles. So this is one of the things that's important for bees, you know, is to make sure we have a balanced amino acid profile. Carbohydrates are going to come from nectar. So nectar that they pick up from the plant may have 20% solids. And they're going to convert that to about 17% water. So we're going from, you know, 20% sugar to 83% sugar. And they're going to do that. Um, by doing so, adding some enzymes to the to the nectar mixture, so there's invertase that will split um, sucrose into glucose and fructose. They're going to dehydrate the the honey or the nectar to make honey. So we're, you know, they'll actually spread out the the nectar throughout the hive into a bunch of little drops, and then they'll move a lot of air through the hive in order to try to evaporate some of the water out of there. They'll gather up the little drops, put them back together. They'll keep working them, adding extra e enzymes. They also add um, enzymes that will produce some hydrogen peroxide and gluconic acid. Um, you know, so the honey does have some other properties that help keep it from fermenting or going bad after it's being stored. 
So one of the things that they do when they're going to store pollen is they will mix some of the honey and the pollen together and they make kind of what's called a bee bread, which is actually a fermented product. Um, so one of the questions that's out there now is, you know, people say, oh, fungicides, you know, they can't hurt bees because, you know, it has to be an insecticide that would hurt bees. But actually, if a fungicide gets in here, destroys some of the yeast that's causing that fermentation, uh, maybe we do have issues with bees if, um, you know, if they're exposed to fungicides. So honeybees will do something that's called drifting. So they go out, they, they're going to, you know, go collect nectar, go collect pollen, they're going to come back to their hive, um, but they're not always perfect. So they tend to do pretty well, but if they miss out on where they're coming back to, maybe they come to a neighboring hive and, and actually, you know, this is one of the ways that we could spread diseases around is by having bees come back somewhere that they don't belong to. Maybe they've got some mites, maybe they've got some American fowl brood, you know, they could spread those diseases around. The other thing they do is robbing. So in the fall time, you know, especially after we've, you know, lost our goldenrod and our fall flowers, um, a strong hive that senses somebody else is weaker and has honey, they may just rub all that honey out of there. So if you have a hive that's weak because of varroa mites or because of American fallow brood, you know, a good strong colony might go in there and pull out all that honey store, killing that hive, but at the same time they would bring home all the spores from the American fallow brood um, or more varroa mites. In the winter time, a lot of people ask, you know, what goes on in the winter? And the bees don't really hibernate. They actually they keep their cluster at about 90 degrees. Um, and when they start raising brood, they'll actually raise that up to about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So, um, you know, people have studied different temperatures. We will open up hives in the winter time to see what they're looking like, you know, as far as food storage. But otherwise, we tend not to disturb them because we don't want them to, um, you know, to get too cold. Hornets and wasps, you know, you see that paper nest. There's actually no living individuals in there in the wintertime. So if you have one of those big paper nests and you want to collect it, wintertime is a perfect time to do that. Or if you do collect one of those nests in the summertime, you put it in the freezer and then you don't have to worry about the, about the getting stung after a couple of days. You can just pull that back out of the freezer and all the, uh, all the individual hornets in there will be dead. So wintertime, other thing to keep in mind, bees don't defecate in the hive. They eat honey, they vibrate their muscles to generate heat to keep them warm, and they need to go outside in order to defecate. So they're looking for cleansing flights. We really like to have some 50 degree weather or 60 degree weather for them to come out and do that. So that thaw that we typically get up here in January really helps out with that. And when we don't have that, we worry about bees getting diarrhea. A lot of people will assume that diarrhea means they have a disease called nosema, but in actuality, it could just be they have diarrhea because they haven't been able to get out and fly in order to do a cleansing flight. They've been holding it, and now they have some diarrhea afterwards. Um, so we want to be a little bit careful about just pronouncing any diarrhea as a disease called nosema because that's, uh, that's really not the case. So you guys, as you know, veterinarians, we're going to go look at bees, what are we going to need to do? It would be really nice to have some sort of protective clothing on. You know, people may get you, you know, pick on you a little bit, you know, if you come out and you've got gloves and a hat and veil and, um, you know, coveralls and boots, you know, they may pick on you a little bit about that. But the important thing is you've got to be comfortable doing this because how do you think about this person's problem, this hive's problem, if if you're afraid, you're going to get stung, and you just don't want to be there. You know, if you're petrified to begin with, it's really hard to be a veterinarian and, and think about the problems at hand. So you need to wear what's going to make you comfortable. As a minimum, you need to wear a veil. So the bees are attracted to fast motion, and your eyes blink, and you have no control over that. And that's one of the things that the bees would, would be a, attracted to, and then you may get stung in the face. And that's probably some of the worst places to get stung. Um, I got stung once right on the tip of the nose, and I had a cold for about a week afterwards. Um, you know, middle of the summer, it just, you know, it can set certain things off. 
you see these two folks here wearing leather gloves, and that's something that you probably need to avoid as a veterinarian because leather is very difficult, if not impossible, to clean. So you can't really, um, you can't go to this apiary, wear your leather gloves, and then go to the next apiary and use those same gloves. You know, maybe you need to have that apiary provide you some gloves if you need leather gloves. Um, or maybe you have a pair and that's just part of the fee is, you know, there's a $20 pair of gloves and, and that's your gloves now. What we typically wear is just disposable nitrile gloves and we'll get the thicker milker gloves, um, you know, and we seem to do well with those. You can feel through them so you know where the bees are when you're moving frames around. You can actually feel things. Um, and then we can take those off at the end of the day and not have a bunch of um, propolis or wax on us. You probably need to have a smoker um, you know, to keep the bees calm. And this is one of those things that we would need to you know, light and make a fire. So I use a propane torch to get that done. Um, you know, I just aim that torch into whatever I'm burning, and I seem to be able to get a, pr a smoker to start and then stay lit for the whole day. You need to be careful about that if you're doing multiple stops in the day because, you know, you put a smoker in the back of your truck and you get a lot of air blowing through there. Um, you know, you could have that ignite, and that's really not a good thing to have burning. Keep hitting it twice. Um, so bee stings. You know, the stinger has a barb on it on the workers. Um, and once they sting, you see in the bottom picture here, the insides of the bee get ripped out. So they're really, this is a terminal event for the bee. They're not looking to sting. The hornets and wasps don't have that barb, so when they sting, they can pull it back out and sting again. Um, but with our honeybees, we can't, they can't do that. Um, it's possible that you could have anaphylaxis shock. You know, maybe you need some epinephrine, some Benadryl. Maybe you need to get to the emergency room. You know, if you think you're allergic to bees, you should probably discuss this with your doctor so that you're not uh, um, you're not getting in trouble here. You need to work in a calm manner. So if you start doing, you know, we talked about them being attracted to their eyes and being suited to sting if they see those fast motions. Same thing with your hands and your behavior. The falling barometric pressures, so it's getting ready to rain, the bees will get very defensive at that time as well. Um, if you're wearing black clothing, you know, people talk about that reminds the bees of bears and they don't like that. Wool or fleece, or if you've got long hair and the bees get caught up in that, um, they typically will just start to stink. So you want to be a little bit careful about wearing that kind of stuff, a nice light colored um, uh, smooth type of clothing is the best thing. Um, if you go out with a beekeeper and they've got boots and two jackets and four pairs of pants on, that means they probably really don't know how to work bees. And one of the things you might be able to offer as a beekeeper veterinarian is, you know, to show them how to work bees calmly. And hopefully, as you see more people, you'll you'll figure out some of the people that do this well and follow their lead. Um, rather than the folks that are going to suit up for, for battle and just go hard at the bees. Anytime you get into crushing a lot of bees, you can have more disease. You know, if their body is smushed and the bees come up and they start licking it all up to take it outside, um, you know, it's a very good fecal oral route of disease transmission. So antibiotics. You know, that's kind of the main thing I think the veterinarians are thinking about. You know, we've got two diseases that we'd use antibiotics for, American fowl brood and European fowl brood. Um, other disease treatments are out there. So all of the mite treatments are regulated by the EPA, and there's a lot of those. So the beekeepers don't need to have prescriptions for those. They can obtain those. Um, fumagillin is an antibiotic that um, lost its NADA in the U.S. because the company that used to make it gave up uh, making it and didn't file any of the paperwork. It was not removed because it was unsafe, so right now the FDA is saying, by our enforcement discretion, we'll let it come in from, Cal uh, from Canada. Um, that's subject to change at any time, so you know, it would be nice if this company that does make this, if people want to use this, um, you know, that they would get their approval. And that's, that's an antibiotic that 
is not medically important, so it, it wouldn't be on this list of VFD and RX drugs anyways. The pictures that we have here are American fowl brood. So the top we see where the cappings are all um, you know, sunk in and they're chewed out at odd places rather than in the center of the, of the, of the cappings. And in the bottom, we see a roping test. So this is where we put a matchstick or a piece of grass in there. And American fowl brood infected larvae will stretch out um, in a big rope, you know, maybe out to about an inch, as opposed to there's no other disease that will kill larvae that really makes that happen. So we have choices when we're going to give antibiotics. We need to have an antibiotic order. And we could either use a prescription or a veterinary feed directive, a VFD. So the prescription, both of these generally require a VCPR. Um, for the VFD, if your state doesn't have a good definition of a VCPR, then you need to use the federal definition. So you need to establish a relationship between the veterinarian and the beekeeper and their bees. And that generally involves being there. So you need to go visit the hives. You need to go you know, work with the beekeeper a little bit to know what they're doing. Um, prescriptions, you know, I bet everybody knows where their prescription pad is. All three antibiotics have a water-soluble form that's available through a prescription. So you could write a prescription for oxytetracycline, and the beekeeper would get it, mix it with sugar, and feed it to his bees. That's still a prescription use, and you're following the directions when you do that. If you need extra label drug use, it's allowed when you do a prescription. And the prescription may expire at some point, but that's basically up to you. Um, so you know, for a lot of people, they would say you could get this prescription filled up to a year later. On the VFD, a couple of big, big things that are different. Um, the, the FDA has changed the rules, so you don't necessarily need to send this VFD to a licensed medicated feed mill or distributor, you can actually get this from any feed mill or any distributor of, of VFD drugs. Um, extra label drug use is prohibited, but it may not be enforced. So there's some other you know, guidance for compliance that came out from the FDA saying maybe we don't need to have, you know, maybe some extra label drug use is OK in the minor use and minor species, which is where the bees would fall. You need to keep the original records for at least two years. In New York and Ohio, I know it's three years. And it must expire within six months. So you, know, you would need a different VFD if you want to treat in the other half of the year if you're, if you're doing a once a year exam with a, you know, to form your VCPR. So the labeling of the antibiotic is what's going to make a difference as to whether it's VFD or prescription. So the, FDA issued a lot of guidance, saying, or a lot of um, words saying we're going to make anything that you feed require VFD and anything that you use in water to be a prescription. But that's basically how it's used in the major species. And in bees, pretty much all of the uses are the same. You know, we're looking for mixing it up in dry powdered sugar. Um, with oxytetracycline, we do have some other options because of the VFD labeled drugs where the antibiotic could be put in a patty that's made up with sugar and grease like Crisco um, or where it's made put in sugar water. The Thailand and lincomycin we really don't want to have in sugar water because it will lead to um, residues later on. So we need to make sure that's only fed in the sugar. Um, so all of these are used the same way. So the antibiotics are all labeled for the control of American fowl brood or the control of European fowl brood, um, which, according to the FDA, requires that you have a diagnosis of one of those diseases in order to be controlling its spread. So you know, a lot of beekeepers are going to ask you for a prescription for an antibiotic, and they don't have any American fowl brood. Um, you know, they may not even have European fowl brood, and they're you know, they're, they're looking for these antibiotics. So, you know, what they're really looking for is a prevention use, in which case we're looking at extra-label drug use. And my contention is that with the extra-label drug use on the prescription products, that's legal. That's been set up long ago with Amduca. Um, 
you know, and the, the extra label drug use on the VFD products is a little bit more limited in the com, you know in their compliance document. Um, so I think we really do want to be sticking with prescriptions instead of VFDs for bees. Um, but there are you know there are products out there, and you can decide how far you want to push things for reading the letter of the law with these. So there is a form that the AVMA puts out. Um, so this is a blank form that you could go and fill out. You don't need to subscribe to any of the electronic um, services, but if you do, you can make up your your VFDs there as well if you want to do that. Um, you know, if you do have a control use, you know, this I think this is a a very you know good thing. And a lot of the information that you need to put on there is the information you should probably be providing anyways. So, you know, honeybee prescription issues. You know, we're identification of hives. We don't put ear tags in bees. You know, so we're really going to be identifying them based on the location. You know, the 911 address that they're doing, where they're living, where the bees are. Um, you know, you're going to need to personally go out there and visit. So you're not necessarily going to be able to establish a VCPR with telephone or pictures or emails. A lot of beekeepers would really like to do that. Um, and AVMA Plit has said that they will acknowledge that if you're working with bees, that you know you have coverage for liability there as well if you're using the AVMA for your for your uh, professional liability insurance. We need to make sure we know what products are available. You know, they at at first, teramycin was a category two drug uh, because honeybees had a withholding period. But now there are no withholdings in major species, and the FDA has said they're only going to count major species for determining if a if a drug is category one or two. So now any feed mill can obtain teramycin in order to be able to mix and make um, the type C medicated feeds. So there are a couple of bee suppliers that are doing that now. Man Lake um, and Dayton are both doing that. Some of the others may or may not do that. We've kind of decided not to do that with Better Bee because most of our clients are hobbyist beekeepers who we don't think should be feeding antibiotics. So we're going to have that discussion with people a little bit more. Um, prescription products of Oxytep, you know, they come in smaller packets. So if you do have somebody that's only got 10 hives, you know, they may they may very well settle for the prescription as well. You know, European foul brood, this is a bacterial disease, you know, that it may may actually work well in order to treat those, and you can kill that because that's a, a, a Melissa coccus, it's kind of like a streptococcus, so it does cure with antibiotic treatment. American foul brood, basically all that's happening there is we're covering up clinical signs and hiding the disease. So the equipment, the bees, the honey that's in that hive that's contaminated with those spores is still contagious. Europe prohibits using antibiotics to treat this disease, and most people, you know, when they really understand the disease, are thinking maybe we shouldn't be using antibiotics to treat, you know, as a treatment for this disease. So for veterinarians, um, you know, bees are going to need preventive care, parasite control, disease diagnosis, disease treatment, beekeeper education. When I was working as a bee inspector in veterinary school, it's like I'm being a vet during the day. I'm only working with bees, um, even though I haven't graduated yet. So a lot of the stuff that we're learning about, that's what we were doing. Now, I think the veterinarians are in a great place for this. The FDA does too. That's why they've uh, pushed us into this spot. Um, but we are going to need to step up the pace a little bit and learn more about bees. There are a bunch of places out there that are going to be working on continuing education. I know. You know, this event, AVMA is going to have stuff. Um, C, the Central Veterinary Conference is going to have stuff. And we're working, we're forming a group called the Honey Bee Veterinary Consortium, which is basically just getting started, but looking to be able to help to educate veterinarians about honeybees. There are some books out there. Um, you know, we sell all these at Better Bee. You can go online and get these. Um, this OIE book, Bee Health and Veterinarians, um, you know, typically has been ordered out of Europe, but it is available in the U.S. now. Um, that was a 2014 publication, and this other, this purple book from France is a 2015 book. So both very good references. 
And the Beekeeper's Handbook on the right, uh, written by Dr. Samachero and Ivatabile, um, you know, is a very good basic honeybee biology book. Um, we use that in all of our beginning classes that we teach. Uh, there's a few websites here, you know, the Honeybee Veterinary Consortium, the Bee Inform Partnership, um, Scientific Beekeeping. There's a lot of great information on that website. Um, the USDA Extension Services, they all have great sites as well. I appreciate your attention. I know we're running tight on um, time, and uh, I think we'll pick up with some questions here. Thank you, Dr. Cripps. We will now open the line for the question and answer session. As a reminder, you may submit questions to the webinar system by selecting the questions tab on the webinar screen and typing in your question, or you may click on the raise your hand icon on the webinar screen, and your line will be unmuted so that you may ask a question. Um, Dr. Cripps, we have our first question. How do I write a health chart for bees I have just examined? You, yeah, so you are not allowed to write health charts for honeybees. So honeybees, all the health charts come from the state apiarist. So they're usually in plant industry and not in animal science, or not in animal industry. Um, and I think this is one of the things that would be really nice for us as veterinarians to be able to come to the to the state apiarist and say, let's try to set something up like the, you know, the accreditation program where, you know, you don't have to come out and examine the bees that I just examined. You know, you kind of train us and you take our word for some of this. Um, you know, but that doesn't exist right now. Okay, another question. Uh, why is the queen tied to the balloons on the end of that fishing pole, and what was the what is the purpose in beekeeping? So that was a demonstration. So that guy is looking to show you that the drones will make a little comet behind the queen and will mate with her in the air. So basically she's tied there so we know where she is. Typically in beekeeping that's not something that's done. The queen just flies out, you know, does her mating stuff and comes back and nobody's any the wiser. Um, you know, when she does mate, the drones lose their phallus, you know, and they actually die after they've mated. Um, so, it, you know, kind of like stinging for the, for the workers, it's kind of a terminal event for the drone to mate. Um, our next question. If you had a commercial beekeeper approach, um, you about using a product like TerraPro that is listed as a VFD on the seller site. Would you issue a VFD for it if you did not have any active infection, or would you use a prescription alternative? Yes, would probably be the answer to that. Um, you know, it, it's going to kind of depend on the on the situation and how far I wanted to push things or how brave I was feeling. Um, you know, strictly to the letter of the law, there's no infection, so you're not using it for control. With VFD, there is some compliance guidelines saying that you can use um, extra label drug use in certain cases, but um, you know, you, you've got a RX alternative available to you, so that extra label drug use in the in the feed form doesn't really come in, but. I really don't think the FDA is too inclined to want to enforce that. Um, so they they may acknowledge that you know you're using it in the same manner anyway. So let's just you know let's allow you to use that VFD form. I think that's one of those places where the VF, where the FDA needs to clarify a little bit what they're going to do. Letter of the law, it should be RX. Okay. Next question. Does providing antibiotics affect a high USDA organic status? I would assume so. I'm not sure that there's too much organic status in the U.S. for honeybees. Um, you know, but if you're using antibiotics, I would think that would lose you all your organic status. Um, next question. My understanding of the CPG is that mixing the antibiotic with sugar 
would make it a VFD since the prescription is only allowed in water. Is this true? Um, and the second question I'll follow up to this is what is the proper disposal, disposal of unused antibiotics? Yeah, so the, the VFD versus prescription question, um, I think that's coming up because the FDA said, you know, anything that's fed, we're going to make a VFD, and anything that's in water, we're going to make a prescription. But they're, they're, we're talking about major species uses and how are they going to label the antibiotics that were out there. So something like teramycin, that's a VFD approval, um, would require a VFD in order to use it, you know, in order to feed that product to bees. But there's tetracyclines, you know, like, you know, all the generics that have different NADAs that are labeled for prescription use, they're going to be mixed the same way in dry sugar, um, but it's going to be a prescription use. It's not going to be a VFD, even though it's fed in dry sugar. You're going to do the prescription, and you're following the label directions by mixing it in dry powdered sugar. So, so I don't, you know, I think you're, I think you're mixing up stuff there that. Um, that, you need, that, that shouldn't be mixed up. And I think basically the FDA should have said, we're going to tell you what's a VFD and what's a prescription. And if you go into their website and you look up what the drug is, it'll either tell you that it's for VFD use or for prescription use. That you, won't, um, you, know, you don't need to make up that decision. And then the proper disposal of unused antibiotics, um, I don't have a good answer for that. I'm probably the wrong person to ask. Um, are there any withdrawal time requirements for antibiotic use in bees? So there are definitely withdrawal times. So I think you've got a 42-day withdrawal after feeding Oxytet and 42 or 56 days for the other two antibiotics. So you need to make sure that, that you follow those withholding times and calculate those out well because they're before honey collection. You know, you tell somebody to use antibiotics and then they they just go ahead and do that, but they're, um, you know, it's at the wrong time of the year, and they end up putting on their honey supers a lot earlier than they thought. They need to know that they shouldn't be putting on honey supers until that withdrawal period is over if they are using antibiotics. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Um, regarding beekeeping medicine, is it limited to rural area areas, and what kind of limitations are there for beekeepers in cities, and what are veterinary, veterinarians' responsibilities in those cities? Um, so a lot of cities may have ordinances against bees, but I know in New York City they've removed those ordinances. Um, so there are bees that are you know on the rooftops, and that provi provides a whole new you know list of problems for for beekeepers because, you know, all the winds and stuff that are up there may make it real hard for the bees to get out on those mating flights or get down and do some collection and get back to the proper hive. Um, so there are some unique challenges that come in there for beekeeping, um, you know, and there are clubs in the city. So there's two or three clubs in New York City that, that would cover those kind of things. Um, as far as being a veterinarian, I don't know that there's anything special there. Um, you know, you need to have a VCPR, you need to determine whether you need to use these antibiotics, whether that seems reasonable or not, um, make the proper prescription, and then um, be available for follow-up if need be. Um, you know, I think there's probably going to be less call for it because I think most of the city beekeepers are small scale, and they tend not to use antibiotics as much. Thank you, Dr. Cripps. On behalf of CDC's Clinician Outreach and Communication Activity and the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today with a very special thank you to our presenter, Dr. Cripps. Free continuing education credit is available for this call. If you would like to receive continuing education, you should complete the online evaluation by April 22nd. 2017 using course code WC2286. For those who will view the archived webinar after April 22nd, complete the online evaluation between April 23rd, 2017 and April 22nd, 2019 using course code WD2286. All continuing education and contact hours for 
this call are issued online through TCE Online, CDC's Training and Continuing Education Online System at www, the number two, the letter A, dot cdc dot gov forward slash TCE Online. Again, that's www, the number two, the letter A, dot cdc dot gov forward slash TCE Online. To receive information on upcoming COCA calls, subscribe to COCA by sending an email to coca at cdc.gov and write subscribe in the subject line. Also, CDC has launched a Facebook page for clinicians. Please like our page on, on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash CDC Clinician Outreach and Communication Activity to receive COCA updates. If you have any questions, please email us at coca at cdc.gov. Thank you again for being part of today's webinar. We hope everyone has a nice day.